Well, hello there, and welcome to the recording of episode 31 of season two of Marketing Scoop. Um, welcome to everyone watching live. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're a couple of minutes um, later than we intended um, to be, but thank you so much for um, hanging on for us. Um, we just wanted to uh, make sure that uh, everyone was here. Um, Dwayne was here, okay, but uh, Judith had a... a, a <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a rebooting challenge. Yeah, her computer decided to um, do 110 updates. So um, don't reboot your computer just before you're good. Had you to go live on air, peeps. That's not some. <laughs> Although it didn't look very good. So, you know, at least you can see me now. We can. Oh, and right. yeah, and we can we can hear you exceptionally well and see you well. So whatever it um, um, had happened um, isn't going on anymore. So that's a, a very good thing. Um, so we'll get started in the proper podcast recording. Obviously, we were uh, producing a podcast. We're recording a podcast as part of this this live show. Uh, the podcast is Marketing Scoop. If you aren't a subscriber, head over to seomrush.com slash podcast and make sure you're su subscribed to the audio podcast. Um, you will not get all these incredible bonuses at the beginning of each episode. Um, you'll just get straight information. So um, if you'd like to miss out on the bonus features, then make sure you subscribe to the audio podcast. Um, but just before we get started, um, Judith, um, we were saying just before we went on air that um, some SEOs are up in arms at the moment. I think SEOs are always up in arms, but um, <laughs> this is particularly bad. I think um, the interesting thing is that Google is injecting uh, ads into more and more of our lives. So I don't know if you were aware, but there's a, a new um, discovery section in Google uh, for those on mobile, and they're going to be injecting ads into that. They're going to be injecting, or I think they're already injecting ads into images. There's more and more and more of the organic search results that are being pushed below the fold. So we're sort of getting that old school Yahoo homepage thing happening. So pretty soon it's going to look just like Yahoo again. And then some other young upstart will come along and say, hey, it's clean here. Maybe DuckDuckGo or something similar. And, and we'll get um, a whole new search engine evolve out of the chaos. SEO will never die. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe SEO. Yandex will be the... SEO, SEO will never die, David, but SEOs might have heart attacks <laughs> during the process of growth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we, we all might suffer considerably during the changes. You know, it, yeah. it's funny, it, it's funny, Judith, because you brought this up in our pre-roll and I was kind of thinking about it and I was joking about, you know, like, oh, we all know how this ends. And um one of the things that I've always found fascinating about this is um, is the conversation around trust. And that is a critical component of what drives things like injecting more advertising. Because let's face it, like nobody wants to be advertised to. If you take a poll of a thousand people, two thousand people will respond telling you, don't advertise to me. You know, like it's it's we are just that hardwired to say no to it. However, if you show me something, and I believe it's trustworthy, we can skip the entire conversation around whether it's an ad or not. And we can now delve deeply into, is it useful to me or not? And so when you think about Google, they are on a, I will say a relentless march. Um, and I don't mean that in a negative connotation, because when I worked for Bing, Bing was on this same relentless path. And this focus has to be and the focus is on intent, in discovering intent, in defining it, and being accurately able to predict it. If you have that, if you know you can do that, is it really an ad anymore if I give it to you and you find it useful? I mean, it may be an ad in that it was paid to be placed there, but is it an ad in the negative connotation that we as consumers have all grown to think of advertising? And so now suddenly we're looking at this saying, well, hold on a second. And this is, you know, I think we're kind of back to our joke, which is the like, you know, SEOs are going to have heart attacks over this. Um, I think the reality is that to be successful today, it is not a one track approach. It is a multi track approach. And in order for those ads to be successful, you have to have structured data on your website. You have to have the right content. You have to be useful. You have to be answering questions. You have to participate in all these areas. So SEO will always be there. And 
it's that type of added exposure that builds the trust. So when somebody does see an ad injected into their limited amount of real estate, they are already feeling comfortable with you. And so to them, it doesn't translate as an ad. It translates to, oh, I was thinking about buying a new pair of cowboy boots. And here you are with an offer. Thank you. <laughs> Creepy minority you know. report world. Yeah, but you know, the funny thing is, I think consumers are getting more comfortable with that. Like I think of my my age group, and we were very like, no, you can't have my phone number. No, you can't have my email address. <laughs> the hell, you say I'm not giving you my credit card. Like, and today it's all like, oh, look, I want that app. Well, then you have to give us access to all your data. Oh, okay, take it. Everything, yeah. you know, and that includes your credit card. It includes your social insurance number. It includes everything about you, just because you want access to whatever that app happens to do, edit photos, whatever it is. And, and I think consumers are becoming maybe more inoculated to that. And they're just like, you know, oh, okay, I'm fine with it. And <laughs> I, completely, I, I completely agree that the, the relevance um, is improving and the serving of the perceived intent is improving. I think my main concern is that the opportunity to discover something that you didn't know that you wanted uh, or that... Um, Perhaps it's a really small startup. Um, it mm -hmm. doesn't really have as much of an opportunity because they haven't taken the time to really optimize everything that they're doing to be able to compete efficiently with the players already there. Or, or honestly, David, it often comes down to pure budget. I mean, think think of advertising on. Um, I mean, before we we got the show going here, um, David and I were sitting on the on the uh, line patiently waiting for Judith to work <laughs> out her Microsoft update issues, uh, which I will apologize for being ex Microsoft. I will just tell you right now, I apologize. It's all um, your fault. <laughs> totally, because that's what I ran when I was there. Um, and, uh, and and one of the things that David and I were talking about is uh, the new platform uh, TikTok and what it is, what it is not, the value. I'm very active there. Um, I'm already seeing benefits accrue to me in terms of accessing different uh, or accessing different uh, features that they have to be turned on by the administrators of TikTok because you hit some kind of level, whether it's quality or quantity or whatever. And, and so if you look at a platform like that, or even you look at something more familiar like Facebook or, um, or uh, Instagram, you know, David, to your point, um, like I can run a campaign there for a hundred dollars for two weeks. Now, even the smallest direct to consumer or startup or even single proprietorship from their living room business can generally find 50 bucks a month for advertising. And that advertising is so much more targeted than anything we've ever had historically. You know, I get to pick my region. I get to pick male or female, I get to pick their interests, the category, I get to get in on the keyword level. And, and this is this is really powerful stuff. So I can, I can kind of understand how consumers get trained that those inline ads are useful, because you brought me cool stuff that I'd never see at a big box store or a brand name company, because it's such a small thing, you know, there's only 15 available. And you know, that doesn't get stocked at your large brand. Uh, you know, so I mean, I, I can see this change happening, um, you know, and I think it's extremely important how businesses respond to this and what they think about it. So these are the kind of thoughts that the viewers get that turn up to watch live. The, um, um, yeah. It's uh, really, really th thought provoking and um, great to be discussing um however we've received a comment comment from fern kane saying the sound is garbled wonder why now I, I i'm not sure if that's one person or if that's all of us i i can hear both of your audios completely fine can, can you hear me fine i can indeed yeah uh, mm -hmm. There's an odd accent, David, but other than that, it's fine. <laughs> I know, you I sound know. sound exactly like Sting. Hash, and, hashtag um, Canucks, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I, I sound normal. <laughs> Dwayne sounds normal. Yeah. I think we all sound, yeah, totally. Yeah. You've got this weird thing going, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I only discovered that word last week, actually. I, what, <laughs> I was researching. <laughs> As you do. Wait, you're the guy wearing the T-shirt that says, cool keyword, bro. 
<laughs> you just discovered a cool keyword last week. Yes, I did. Yeah, I don't know every word. <laughs> Education never ends, right? Indeed. Always learning. We're always learning here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so Fern, tell us if it's anyone in particular or just the, the audio yeah. as a whole that you're struggling with. And if you know, anyone else that's watching, we've got a few people watching live now, please let us know in the chat where in the world you happen to be, uh, what you think of our discussing discussion so far. Obviously, we're moving on to local listings, the ROI of yes. optimizing your local listings, just in a second here. Um, Fern saying, my iMac is fine. Never heard this problem before, but I can still make out your words. Okay, but Fern, is it everyone's words? Afraid. Yeah, do not be afraid to name names. Indeed, yes. <laughs> yeah, just don't name me. <laughs> oh, <exactly. laughs> I only just, just got this working again. I thought it was working fine, but... It may have just been latency in a moment across the network, too, because that'll happen sometimes, where the internet just slows down, and yeah. everyone on that node gets a bit slower, so... That I keep happen. complaining about my spamming tool, but you know I wasn't running it at full force, so it should have been fine. Oh, no, it wasn't. Yeah, then it wasn't you. <laughs> <laughs> so we all sound good to to Jim. So Jim uh, can hear us okay. So awesome. um, we love you, Jim. I'll, I'll take that as a positive vote. Let's get going <laughs> with the the proper podcast introduction, and otherwise we're going to be um we're going to be going to bed in this show. But <laughs> <laughs> depending where we're in the world, <laughs> anyway. I'll start with the introduction now. Marketing Scoop Season 2, Episode 31. What's the ROI of optimizing your local listings? Brought to you by SEM Rush, this is Marketing Scoop. I'm David Bain. And I'm Judith Lewis. And welcome to the SEM Rush show that reveals the latest digital trends and technologies that impact your marketing strategy. Together with industry, <laughs> together Sorry, with industry experts, I'm going to say that once more. <laughs> together with industry experts, we delve into SEO advertising and content marketing. I think I'm going to re-record this afterwards, yeah, to uncover the <laughs> ultimate recipe for digital marketing success. Um, there are many reasons behind that, everyone, but I'm not going well, to let you classy. into it. <laughs> So we all know that there are so many things that you can be doing as a digital marketer and you've got to prioritize your time and your focus on the areas that you think will deliver the biggest return on investment. And that often means that spending time on doing things such as optimizing your local listings can get left behind. But is that a mistake? And what is the true value of ensuring that your local listings are fully optimized? Those are some of the questions that we're going to be asking our guest on today's show. A man with 20 years, 20 years, he looks not a day over having 10 years experience <laughs> of direct search and digital marketing experience. He previously headed up the Bing Webmaster program. Thank you very much. That's a very sexy dashboard you guys have and is currently welcome. VP of Industry Insights at Yext. Please welcome Dwayne Forrester. Hey, thank you very much, guys. Uh, obviously, fantastic to be on the show with you guys. Super excited um, and obviously a big fan. Uh, and not just because you say nice things about me. I was a fan before you said nice things. You know, I was a fan. It's um, a Canadian thing. We're all fans. Yeah, no, exactly. I love the world because I'm Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> <You know. laughs> Stop giving our secrets away. They'll all expect yeah. us to love them. <laughs> well, that's, that's, the, that's the secret, right? Is everyone thinks Canadians are nice or not? God, that's no, not no. that's not who we are when we're like doors closed at home. That's this is us. why we gave poutine to the world. It wasn't exactly. kindness. No, we just wanted you to not come anymore. We just <laughs> wanted some peace and quiet. Leave us alone here. For those of you who don't know, what's Jeez. poutine? Oh dear. Uh, so poutine oh, is French Canadian. I would like to point out it comes to us from Quebec, and it is French fries, which are glorious and lovely. And then on the French fries, you put cheese curd now hot french fries means the cheese curd melts a little bit and then you put hot gravy on top mm -hmm. of that and that's poutine and i i figured that plus beaver tail which is basically yes. sugar is, yes. is it's okay for us canadians in the winter eh but there i said anyway. um but for the rest of the world it will kill you yes so so to judah's point okay if you are not in canada during the winter you can't consume these things you need this to keep your um keep your core temperature up during those you know balmy winters that we have in canada um and 
The only other ingredient that I would add if you are anywhere outside of Canada is a cardiologist. Yes. So, well, um, and a diabetes uh, doctor too. Uh, and yeah, you've yeah. also got half the audience wondering about these beavers wandering about in Canada without any tails on. <laughs> well, a in, beaver tail is yeah, not, it doesn't come from a ta tail. Yeah. Um, don't it's, tell them no about the strawberry are. flavor, Dwayne. Because yeah, so no beavers are harmed in the making of a beaver tail. Um, what you want to think of is you want to think of um, two square feet of donut um, and um, add your toppings on it. Uh, sometimes they can be stuffed. Um, it, it's it's an endless cornucopia of um, churro meets donut and sugar with spices and or seasonings and or flavorings. Um, it is a group thing to consume a beaver tail. Yes. I've never been able to consume one on my own. They're physically too large. Uh, and, I think and, you could use one as a sail if you needed to. Or or a small raft. Yeah. Small raft, yeah. yeah. Although you might eat yourself off your own flotation device. They <laughs> so, are that good. Fern's asking, are you talking about beavers? No, no, not Judith, real beavers. What's the, no. what's, <laughs> what, what, what's the can of worms. What's the well theme done, of Judith. today's episode, Judith? <laughs> Today's episode theme is nothing to do with food. It's actually, well, it could be, but uh, it's actually about success stories. So, Dwayne, we're going to be talking to you about the success story uh, of uh, Enterprise Holdings. So we're going to be delving into that, which is actually, apparently, the largest car rental company in the world. And uh, apparently, according to uh, a little birdie that told me, or a little David, uh, it experienced a 31% growth in search views by optimizing their local listings. And I, I know that um, local listings have become sexier recently. And I was wondering what kind of challenges you typically face when you're uh, initiating this sort of project. I mean, obviously it's like eating an elephant one bite at a time, but, but right. when you're tackling something like this, what do you do? So, you know, this really comes down, um, and I'm going to try to kind of bridge the worlds here with this one, right? Because this does, the answer to this kind of does come down to how big you are and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, for a company like Enterprise, they are, if you will pardon the obvious reuse of this word, an enterprise level corporation, um, they have a lot of challenges that will reach quite far down towards small businesses. So that being identifying all of the objects they need to maintain. Um, making sure that they have buy-in from the strategic people inside the company, um, you know, making sure that the timing of changes and updates and whatnot follows a cadence that supports other initiatives instead of shortcutting them or causing an issue. Um, and then there may be a technology stack issue. Less of a problem, I think, for smaller businesses because they can generally pivot a little bit quicker on their own and, and kind of like, oh, I don't like, you know, Drupal, I can move to WordPress. And, and they can make that happen. Whereas if you're a large corporation, you have legacy platforms that you maybe proprietarily have invested in. And that becomes a very big problem because then managing all your data, once you've identified it, you, you don't have the facility to do that. And and I think, um, you know, those are some of the biggest challenges. Um, on top of that, what I think of as the meta challenges are like getting people to understand it, like to understand what it is you're trying to accomplish. Because for so many companies, so many times, the conversation around, quote, local um, comes down to name, address, phone number, hours of operation. And once I get all those things done, I'm done. And that's it. You know, I don't have to think about it again. And... Probably one of the surest ways to shortcut that thinking is to ask people to, and Judith, we're going to go for food on this one, um, to ask people to take their phone out in the meeting and look up their favorite restaurant and do that in Google Maps. See what comes back as a result. And as you look down through the pieces of information, look at your company and say, is my company prepared to fill in all of these blanks? Have we identified everything? Have we participated in this? You know, there's no easy way for you to tell Google when you're busy at a certain time of day. They are projecting that based on their own information. Or have they made an update somewhere where you get to feed them that information? And if that's changed, what else has changed? And now we have to start looking into areas like structured data, schema.org. 
And, oh, well, you know, I've marked up my hours of operation, my reviews, my number of stars, my price tags. Uh, but is there anything else? Well, actually, yeah, there's, there's a ton more. And we're not just talking local businesses. That local business, because you are on the internet, you are actually capable of global commerce at this point. So in order for you to be the best answer locally, you actually have to be the best answer totally. That is becoming a truth for us. And we were joking earlier about, um, about ads being injected into the mobile space and, um, and that kind of real estate and, and this kind of thing. Um, you know, the search engines, there's two main reasons they'll do something. One, obviously revenue, you know, if, if they can make money from it, then that's important. Uh, they are public companies with a responsibility to show a profit for their shareholders. So they obviously have to invest in those areas. The other biggest focus for a search engine, and I say this having worked inside a major engine, is the consumer experience, is the reduction of friction. It's getting the consumer to the consumer's goal as quickly as possible. And this is evolving. Uh, you know, we mentioned earlier, uh, intent is uh, such a big focus at the search engines. Um, and that's because it's what drives us as consumers. You know, every one of our listeners, think about the last time you had to accomplish something, you had to do something around your home in your backyard, there was something broken and you needed to fix it. What did that entire process look like to you? I mean, obviously there was discovery of a broken thing. And then there was, well, who do I hire to fix it? And then where do I find them? And what do the reviews look like? And then a phone call. And then I didn't get my quote. Are you going to send it to me? Should I be calling someone else? What, all of these things. Um, Google, just this morning, released uh, through Think with Google some new information around the customer journey. And they broke it out across different things, like someone buying a car and someone doing this and someone doing that. And it turns out that their data is showing them that the average purchaser of an automobile is making somewhere in the vicinity of 120 plus queries before they actually engage in going to buy the car. I mean, that's massive. Now, mm -hmm. if you roll that back and you say, you know, I want a slice of pizza near me, I don't think it's going to take you 120 queries to find a piece of pizza near you. However, you are likely to be presented with a number of results which make the choice anything but clear and obvious because it's not just one choice you have, you have three options in there. And if there happens to be a special promotion being run by someone, say a large brand, and the advertising component injects that, well, it comes above your organic. And so, you know, it, it really is, um, today's challenges are not just the technical that you have you know, within your own stack, it's not just creating the right content. It's not about just understanding, um, you know, the intent. Um, there is a lot of challenge around the idea of, well, how do we position this? Is this an organic play? Is this a paid play? Is it social? Do we do this through? Like, all of these things have come back together again. And and ultimately, to me, what it's what it's showcasing to me and what I'm seeing is, you know, I lived through the days of segregation within marketing where. You know, I started at Microsoft, and when I started there, I was part of, part of the SEO team at MSN. I was helping run that. And SEO and pay-per-click at MSN were all together, one team in one room. And because pay-per-click could very clearly show, here's how much I spent, and here's how much traffic I generated, and SEO is, we cost a lot of money. We need to do a lot of stuff. And um, yeah, if it's not paid, we're going to claim it. It was much squishier, that side of the mm -hmm. equation. Pay-per-click was brought out on its own team. They were given their own management. They were moved to a different group and they were responsible for more things than just MSN. And so like that was a typical path in the paid world. And today we're left with this legacy of everything is siloed. And then unfortunately, we also find ourselves now at this moment needing to combine information from all these sources. I mean, ultimately what we're sitting here staring at is the consumer, are, they're looking for answers to questions. They want brand verified answers. They want to trust the answer from a brand that they like and trust or are searching for and move forward. That's so what the they're after. 
Well, one of the things you said, Dwayne, was what are the blanks in relation to my business for your local listing? Yes. Um, so, so how much have local mm -hmm. listings changed over the last few years? And what are two or three of the most important newer facets of local listings that a business should be focusing in on now? So this is, I'm glad you brought this forward, David, because I was, I was having a, a secondary thought on that while I was saying it. And I'm like, I'll never get back to that. So I'm glad you captured it because we can, we can hop back to this now. Um, the, um, so there's the usual stuff, name, address, phone number, uh, there's product categories, there are offers, there are events that are going on. There's all kinds of new areas that may be applicable to a business. I sat down with one of our clients, I'd say sometime in the last six months, I can't remember exactly uh, when it was, but I remember who it was. Um, and they have a couple of stores in my local area here in Southern California. And, and so I know who they are. And, uh, and I said, Hey, you guys should be thinking about events. You know, you should be using the events markup, the schema stuff for that. You should be putting it out there and sharing it. Um, you know, you should be lighting it up through our platform and into the search engines so that they have an awareness of it and can showcase those events locally. And, uh, they all stared at me from across the table and they were like, we don't do events. I'm like, what do you mean you don't do events? Like every Saturday I drive by the outlet down by my home and I see people sitting at a table under a giant 10 foot by 10 foot tent in the parking area, talking to customers, giving away things. I don't know exactly what you're doing there, but that's an event because that's not a regular part of your business. You're doing something. And they were like, oh, we're just having a promotional day. I'm like, that's an event. I mean, people can show up, they can learn something. They can grab some free product from you. They can make an appointment with you. Like think beyond the normal box. Like that's an event. And sure enough, they realized, holy cow, that is an event. So then they started marking up for it. Now those events are showing up as a regular part of their search result for consumers. Fast forward to the end game here. I have no idea if it's actually driving more foot traffic, what kind of impact it's had on revenue for them, but it is an area to explore. And now I'm going to take us a, a step beyond this even. So this is where you have to understand. So, you know, if you think about structured data, you think about your local business, you think that it's fairly limited. And then you realize that that local business is uh, a celebrity in their community. They're very well known. The owner is well known, been featured locally in the newspaper and so on. So it's kind of important that you mark up your content around the person because they are now a person of interest. And when people tell people about the business, they may tell them about the person, the founder of the business, not the business itself. So as a consumer, I go look up that smiling grandmotherly face on the internet and find out, oh, that's Clara from Clara's Diner. Well, now I'm going to go to Clara's Diner. And so there is a lot of that. And consumers today, especially as myself gets older, and there are new consumers coming in with fresher wallets. We now have Gen Z getting their first jobs, getting their paychecks, becoming consumers. And millennials and Gen Z are going to be far, far larger consumer groups than, you know, the generations that preceded them. Those people have different paradigms for making a decision. It's not just, you know, the usual stuff, location, how far are you from me? Relevance, or do you have what I want? Prominence. What kind of reviews do you have? How many reviews do you have? What are people saying about you? All of those are table stakes. That's expected today. What they're looking for is they're looking for, well, do you support the community? What kind of charities do you give to? Do you support communities within our community? Are you open-minded or closed-minded as a corporation? And those types of things are helping them make decisions on whether they go left or right at the set of lights to meet their needs. Because hey, look, if they're looking for fast food, they can go left and right and get fast food. There's a burger to the left, there's a burger to the right. The burger to the right comes with some, I don't know, societal implications that the ownership of the franchise have put forward. And as a consumer, you choose not to frequent that business, you choose to frequent the other business. So when we talk about you know what's having an impact locally, um, there are some really big obvious drivers. Um, I'm going to say something controversial, and then I'm immediately going to roll it back because um, it is an unprovable statement. So understand that coming right in. Uh, it doesn't matter how much SEO you apply to anything, reviews will trump everything. Um, it's not quite that, okay? 
you still have to do your technical SEO. You still have to cover all the bases. You still need to do structured data. You still need to produce the content. You need to have good product. You need to have alignment within your categories. You need to have all of these structural and technical things buttoned down. But again, I'm going to use the, t the phrase here, table stakes. If you're still thinking about getting that stuff done, you're losing ground to your competitors all day long. You're losing ground. If you already have that stuff done, now you get to step forward. And that's where you get to look into these other areas and say, okay, well, what is the history of my company? You know, um, I, I recently met with a bank and their concern was that um, they're only in 11 states in America and therefore uh, they can't compete with the big national brand that's everywhere. And um, several of the national brands happen to have advertising out right now where they're talking about their history because they realize this resonates with consumers. It's historical, it's trustworthy, it's building that connectivity, it's making you feel like we've always foundationally been a part of your community, we will always be here. And so I'm looking at them saying, you need to draft off that, like where's your campaign? Like build a gift that shows your first location and then a counter with time going on it. And then every location across the region where you've grown, because your story is one of direct connection in those communities. Because let's face it, you don't have a branch in California. I don't expect you to serve me. I'm not going to sign up for a bank account with you, move back to California, and then be like, why don't I get service? Like, that's not realistic. And consumers, they understand that. So are you but, saying that now, just filling out your basic fields for your local listings aren't enough for you to feature prominently within the category of business that you are in? You have to be almost exper experimental with your marketing um, and you have to take every advantage within schema and it's that combination of schema and um, thinking out of the box marketing that is going to drive your success in local listings moving forward. So you put it very succinctly, David, I think that generally aligns up with kind of where my head is at, right? Um, to be successful today, you have to cover all those things that are now considered basic, that unfortunately, a lot of businesses still consider to be a big deal. Um, you don't get credit for doing those things now. That is, we've let you in the party. Now, in order to stay here, you have to pour me a drink. You've gone and you poured someone a drink. You get to stay at the party. That's what those basic things are. If you actually want to get to the head table and be one of the movers and shakers at the party, you have to show a reason why. And that reason may be your reviews are outstanding. Your customer service trumps everybody else's in your category, in your area, in your region. And that just comes down to you and your staff nailing it with customers over and over. So okay. it's, it's doing it in person as well as having it on the internet. You have to marry both yes. things together. And I know a lot of smaller businesses they mm -hmm. can do that very easily, but a large business like enterprises, I mean, you, you've got it's to rely harder. on every local yes. um, iteration. But to begin with, like before you get to the point where you're actually optimizing locally and you're able to observe things like having a tent up on a Saturday and mm -hmm. getting free stuff and like and, and whatnot, before you even get to the point where you're talking to people uh, about optimizing further with schema.org. Mm -hmm. And um, for those of you who are listing, listening, schema.org is a website site that you can go to to find out what uh, schema is available for you to mark up your website with and it's not too difficult to implement there are lots of guides online how do you persuade a somebody like a CMO or a CEO to prioritize actually doing this optimizing for local listings whether it's merchant center or whatever um, uh, sorry merchant listings or whatever over mm -hmm another project like a PPC project where they can mm -hmm. measure it immediately, they get that immediate instant gratification or or some other new website build or something crazy like that. How do we get them to prioritize that local level? So um, Sundar from Google uh, has a quote that was out last year where he talked about the growth of local mobile queries versus mobile queries overall. Okay. And it's important to, um, I'm going to take one thing off the table right now. We're not going to talk about desktop in this because we don't talk about desktop anymore. Let's be clear. We talk about mobile and we talk about voice and we talk about visual. Desktop is now assumed in the background. But his quote was specific to, and I think this was on one of the quarterly earnings reports that they did. His quote was specific around the growth of local mobile over mobile in general. And local mobile 
was growing at a rate that was something like 70% higher than mobile queries overall. Okay, now there's a couple of interesting takeaways from that. First off, we seem to be seeing the beginning of the flattening of mobile query growth, which I think makes sense. We've had a lot of penetration with the mobile devices. Everybody has them. Like we're, you know, you're past all of the newness phase. People have what they want, that kind of thing. Um, so I could understand that. If at some point you max out on that. And, and it's the same thing with desktop. It maxed out and there it was. Um, but what's fascinating about this is people want to do things local. They still want to go to a farmer's market. They still want to have a meal local to them. They still want to go buy a product in their community and bring it home. Um, I have, excuse me, what I think is an extraordinary customer service story um, personally that we can get to in a couple of minutes. Um, and it's all about a local business. Um, it, it's all about how they failed, caught their failure, and then initiated recovery and where we stand today. Um, and, and it's this kind of advantage that I think the smaller local business has, okay, is that they can do things to recover relatively quickly. They can stay on top of it. If we're talking to a larger company and we're talking to the C-suite and trying to get them to understand this, it's extremely important to be able to show them the statistics around local mobile growth and why that is so important, what that engagement looks like. The fact that Google is now injecting more ads because more consumers are going there. What consumer behavior is like today? What What is the decision and inflection point for a millennial or a Gen Z consumer? And what matters? Because all of those things, lest you think that Google is leading us somewhere, Google is following consumer behavior. So if you know what that consumer behavior is, then you have a much greater understanding of, okay, this is why we do this here. And paid advertising, pay-per-click, yeah, okay, it's great, okay, it can sell a product directly and that's awesome. If your goal is to drive people through that door, the pay-per-click advertising is going to get extremely expensive, especially when it gets down to a hyper-local space. You're gonna pay for ads that people will click on and there are no competitors for you. So you are literally foregoing all organic opportunity to pay your way forward when there's nobody competing with you on your block. That is not an effective use of money. And so if you start talking to that CEO or that CMO about efficiencies of budgeting and how you're hiring people and what the resource is being applied to, now you're talking their language around, oh, okay, well, hold on a second. So you're telling me, if I go in and manage the stuff that's largely static, so we'll consider that the name, address, phone number, that kind of stuff, um, and I do that once and maybe I keep an eye on it, you know, every week, every month. And then I do stuff like review management, um, you know, and that's an ongoing thing. Um, you're telling me that can have a big impact on driving people through my door. Yeah, this is a powerful, powerful conversation. And now I'm going to give you the cherry on top of this Sunday reviews. I joke around about how important reviews are. But let's actually take a look under the hood at how important re re reviews are. If you do a query right now for best, you will actually get a different set of results if, than if you didn't. And those results are filtered on the star reviews. So four stars are better, you're included in best queries, four stars are less, well, 3.9 or less, you're not included. Now, fascinating, fascinating bit of information if you are to respond, if you responded to, I think it's between 60 and 80% of your reviews over a period of, it's either 30 or 60 days, I can't remember what it was. It was a reasonable amount of time. You can influence your star rating between a quarter and a half a star higher. So now you are at 3.8 and you are sitting outside when somebody does a best query, you don't show up. You're just not there. They don't even know you're in the community. And you go and you start answering the uh, reviews, even the positive reviews. You leave a note on there. You say, thank you. You do these things. On the failures, you dive in and you actually try to solve the problem. Whether you solve the problem or not is secondary. Being seen to try to solve the problem is as powerful as solving the actual problem. Uh, you do all of that and you end up with, let's be modest here and say, a quarter of a star in growth you are now suddenly over the four star limit and you are now included in the best queries. So you want to drive more people in there. That's how you do it. And it's, it's a very, um, it's very hands-on process and it pays longer term dividends. But now we're actually talking about 
we're influencing branding, we're influencing positioning of your business, we're influencing the long-term longevity of the business. So what if you woke up tomorrow morning and there was a recession on and you decided we're going to cut our budgets? Okay, your pay-per-click budget is immediately, just like that, impacted. And then that means direct sales are now having an impact. What you are going to continue to move forward on is reputation and the connectivity you've built with consumers over time. Love and it. that comes by all of this expanded footprint that you're building out for your local business. Like all of this applies to the single location downtown in my community and run by two people. Like, and it applies to them as well as it applies to a national brand or an international brand. Talking about international brands, I uh, notice on your enterprise holding study that um, 105 million Google customer actions were tracked over the period yes. um, that you were looking at. So obviously a lot of actions here, but what are some of the most important actions that consumers take on these local listings that um, a business should be tracking, that a business should be looking to try to encourage that's likely to result in some kind of positive impact for them? So this really comes down to what your goals are. Okay. And it, it doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. So if your goal is to get somebody into your door, then the action you want to track is whether they click on get directions, because we all know that if somebody clicks on get directions, the likelihood of them coming to your business as a direct result of clicking on get directions is somewhere north of 90%. So 90% of people who click on that go to the business. So that's obviously one that is a big deal. You want to be able to look at that. Um, phone calls might be another one, um, interest in events, and then looking at, wait, we, we say we have an event here, maybe we should attach a sign up page to it. So not only do we have people come in and say, you know, yeah, I may be interested in going to the event and, and I'll use, you know, Facebook as a great example, because this is where a lot of this happens. You know, people go into events on Facebook, they click on it and say, yes, I'm interested in it. Now you have a stream of information around that. And it's an opportunity to remind them that they're interested. Don't forget to come in and touch them again and that kind of idea. Um, in a lot of instances, what it's about is creating multiple touch points with the consumer in a way that the consumer is comfortable with. This is a, an age old sales tactic. Can I get my foot in your door again? And now we just do it digitally. And it might be that it's, you know, um, somebody looks you up on the map and they just want very pointed information like, you know, uh, when are you open? Are you open on Friday? Yeah, I want to book a reservation. Okay. Then they come back on Wednesday and they're like, I booked my reservation. So now I want to click the make a reservation button. So you got to make sure that's lit up. And then they come in and they make the reservation and they're happy with that. Well, you know, when they do that, they're going to end up on your mailing list. So you have to then make sure that you have a program that's in place that reaches out to them and says, hey, just a heads up, you have a reservation at this day, at this time, click here if you want to make any changes. Um, possibly click here if you want to confirm it, that kind of idea. And then it creates this kind of soft, easygoing touch flow that the consumer isn't bothered by, and yet the entire process is engendering a feeling of connectivity and positivity with your business. Now, when that person shows up at your business, your customer service people better be spot on. Like, your servers better not be having a bad day, your bartender better not mix up the drinks, like, Everything's got to be spot on. And that comes down to who you're hiring, how you're training them, the ethos from the top down in the company. And that is the critical component. If the ethos is, I don't really care, business is fine, you know, my house is paid for, I'm just here because this is what I do now. Well, then everyone else is going to have that attitude and you're going to have a solid 3.2 star review that you can rely on month in and month out to do zero for you. Um, you know, that I actually found I had, um, uh, I, I live in Southern California and as things go in Southern California, you have fire pits in your backyard. So um, my fire pit had a uh, fire ring in it that was corroded. I needed to have it replaced. Contacted a local company, a plumbing company turns out does this work. I contacted them because they had the best reviews. I said, yeah, send me the quote. This is what I need. They sent me the quote. It was outrageous. It was 45 minutes of work for over $1,200. And I'm thinking, yeah, okay, this, this just doesn't work for me, right? So I wrote a one-star review and I posted it. And I said, look, I've never worked with these people before, but the quote for this is outrageous. If they didn't want the work, they should have simply told me, not interested in doing the work. It's that easy. 
The next day, I got a phone call from the owner of that company telling me, Dwayne, we monitor everything. We audit everything. We found a mistake in the quote that we made and that we sent you. We would like to apologize for that. Um, we would love the opportunity to come out and do the work if you're willing to talk to us about it. Because we had a great conversation. You know, he's a local business guy. He's been doing this for 30 years, small business owner. We had a great conversation. While he and I are talking, I had such a great conversation and a connection with him. I was deleting my Google review, just removing it completely because it was clear to me that that is not how he runs his business, that this was a legitimate mistake and he was trying to make that right. So I got rid of it. Um, he came over personally, took a look at the product or the project, quoted it for me. He showed up this morning at my home early, did the work himself and off he goes. He's super flexible on when I pay him. He was professional about it. It was just a great experience. He's taken that from being a four, a one-star review to a five-star review. And that's what I expected because his average rating is 4.7 stars. So I expected this. It turns out he's just a great local small business guy. One of his staff made a mistake. It happened to be with me. Boom, here we go. Smart though, they're monitoring the reviews. They're looking at these things. They're auditing their own work to make sure they catch mistakes before consumers have that moment. And that's powerful. I love it that great digital marketing nowadays is not only about also understanding great traditional marketing, it's actually understanding yeah. great business practice and exactly. just bringing it all back to that. So coming up, an actionable tip from Dwayne. But first of all, I'd like to thank P. Anson for leaving a lovely review on Apple Podcasts. I don't know if you're a gent or a lady, but uh, you say, interesting roster of guests, great podcast. I always feel like I'm learning something which I can't say about too many others in this category. Also a fan of the global guests that get invited on, interesting speakers, plus having a, to tune in and out of multiple countries accents at one time keeps me on my toes. So uh, thanks so much, uh, P. Anson, um, if that's the right way to pronounce your name. Um, if you, dear listener, feel like leaving a review too, we'll certainly read it and we may even read it out on next week's show. But time now for that actionable tip from Dwayne. So uh, related to or not necessarily related to what we've been discussing so far, Dwayne, what is your actionable tip? Don't screw up. Okay, that's that's critical, right? Um, so so this is this is what I'm going to suggest folks focus on. Um, so Reviews obviously a big deal and I don't want to beat this horse too much because this horse needs to walk a fair distance for us as an industry um, But reviews are critical and I believe reviews are foundational to so many areas within an organization That it truly uncovers how you think about your consumer how you want to treat your consumer from the top down So reviews are extremely important. But that's not the tip the tip is structured data, okay? Structured data is something that I was a part of the team that launched structured data at Bing. I was there when we launched it. I can assure you it has not been adopted nearly enough by enough businesses. Local businesses may be looking at it and thinking to themselves, it's complicated, it's technical, I have to pay somebody, it's expensive, it's all of this. Yeah, 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 it is. I'm not going to lie to you, it is. You, you got to do this crap, but you have to do this stuff. Because more and more, what we're seeing is the search engines are using data that is marked up to delineate whether a business is included or excluded from new tests and new services they provide to consumers. So while that's never been the intention, what we are seeing is you're marked up, you're included. You're not marked up, hasta la vista. You're not even in there. Now, as we start to move forward from mobile, which we've already established is like our norm today, because desktop is ancient history, if you look over my right shoulder, you see an Echo Show sitting there. So this world, this world is powered by information that is verified. That structured data is a form of verification. So if you want to be spoken out loud, you got to prove to be trustworthy. And structured data is one step on that. The old way of doing that is waiting months and months and months and getting links and links and links and all this other stuff from third party people that are saying you're great. And hey, guess what? SEOs have found a way to scam all of that and break it. So that's not necessarily the trustworthy path for the engines to follow. They have to follow things that they believe are trustworthy, meaning 
If I tell you to jump through this hoop and you jump through that hoop, I give you a credit for that. That's it's as simple as that. And that's that right there is the future proofing for businesses. It's structured data, it's schema.org, it's all of that markup. And I can assure you, if you go in there, you will find something that's applicable to your business. There's no doubt in my mind. The library that's in there for pieces to be able to mark up either people, places, things, anything, it's extraordinary the depth they have in there now. So you can't tell me, oh, well, they don't have something for me. No, they've got something for everybody. No question. Ah, that's fantastic. So structured data is the way to go. Thank you very much. Uh, you can find Dwayne at, over at Yext dot com. I've been Judith Lewis, your co-host, and you can find me where all good chocolate is sold, plus over at decabit.com. I've been David Bain, your other co-host. You can also find me over at businessbookofthemonth.com. On next week's show, we will be looking at how to market offline products and services from digital advertising. Joining us for that episode will be sales and marketing funnel specialist, John Raj Narad. I really hope I got his name okay. Um, uh, and SEM Rush, SEM Rush Academy PPC professor Joel Bondarowski. Please make sure that you sign up to receive that audio episode as soon as it's released over at semrush.com forward slash podcast. Thanks for joining us for this one, dear listener. Until next time. Be fantabulous and do one thing that scares you. Adios.